Our sermon text this morning comes from the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 29 through 31. As soon as they had left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. And let us begin with prayer. Gracious God, open our hearts and minds this day as we hear your word. And may we have the strength to put your word into practice now and always. Amen. Now, at this point, I usually go forward, but I've, I've got to do one of those confessions. I've left my sermon on my desk. <laughs> I, I don't know why you people come here. I mean, it's not something all put together and everything's perfect. But, but I'm stalling because Debbie's on the way to get it for me. And I can do the opening story. But, you know, either way, you're going to see or bring me the, the, the sermon. So, so, so let's wing it and let's hope she gets here in a timely, in a timely manner. But the, but the opening story opens up with two boys who are good friends. And they decide that to spend some time together, they're going to go spelunking or they're going to explore caves. So, and, they, and they're going to do, they're going to make this a, a whole weekend thing. So they, they pack a big backpack, they put all their appropriate clothes in the backpack, and off they go to explore these caves. And on the last day of their weekend, they go into a cave that has tunnels and caverns, and it opens up into another cave. And this is great, and they're ready to explore and see what else is in these caves and what else is going on. And as they're in this clearing in this inner cave, they see bear tracks, big bear tracks. So they sit down on rocks right there in this inner cave to figure out what it is that they are supposed to do. Do they go forth cautiously, knowing that there's a bear somewhere in this cave, or do they exit quickly and safely and consider their weekend over and go from there? So let's pause on that just for a second and contemplate deeply what it is that I have said thus far. Oh, Debbie's back. Okay, so, all right, so they're, they're cautiously deciding, they're determining what to do, and then they hear the roar of a big bear, a big bear angry bear that is obviously making its way to their position. So scared to death, the boys decide that the best course of action is to run for their lives. As one boy starts to leave, the other reaches into his backpack and pulls out his sneakers. And he starts taking off his hiking boots, and he starts putting on his tennis shoes, and he starts tying up the laces. And his friend starts to panic. And he says, we've got to get out of here. We don't have much time if we are going to outrun this bear. And by this time, the friend's on his feet. His tennis shoes are tied. And he says, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. <laughs> Very predictable. <coughs> when the one boy needed a friend, he discovered that there was no friend in sight. In today's scripture, we find Jesus and Peter being friends to each other in an act of friendship. Good link, eh? I tried to make those, sto the, those stories connect. <laughs> Jesus came to Peter's house and discovered that Peter's mother-in-law was quite ill with a fever. And in a time of need, Jesus came to Peter's side to offer help. Have you ever wondered what makes this miracle so important that it was put into the gospel story. It's just a little kind of side miracle that happens in a home. In his book, Find It in the Bible, Bob Phillips comprises different lists and categories that are contained in scripture. And list number eight is the 37 miracles performed by Jesus. 37 times Jesus does miraculous things. He cured those with leprosy. He restored sight to the blind. He restored hearing to the deaf. 
He removed demons from those suffering. He fed over 5,000 people in one sitting. He walked on water, he turned water into wine, and he even brought people back from the dead. Jesus did these amazing, unprecedented events that were witnessed by scores and scores of people. And yet, here at the beginning of his ministry, in the privacy of someone's home and out of the public's view, he performed this healing. The importance of this miracle lies in the behavior of Jesus. In these three little verses, our Lord and Savior has much to teach us about love. First, the thing that Jesus showed us is that he displayed love by taking the time to help. Now, in the passage, in the verses that come just before this story, Jesus was in the synagogue teaching. And a man who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, and Jesus sternly made the spirit leave the man's body. And all who bore witness to this were amazed that Jesus could teach with such precision and authority that even evil spirits obeyed him. In the book, All the Miracles in the Bible, Herbert Lockyer makes this statement. After Christ's exorcism of the unclean spirit, Jesus, along with Andrew, entered the house of Simon Peter, where his wife's mother was bedridden with a fever. Doubtless Christ retired to his disciples' home for rest and refreshment. But before he partook of the proffered entertainment, there was another work of mercy to perform. So Jesus did what he always did. He helped, he addressed a need, he gave healing whenever and wherever he could. Now, on Sundays, most ministers, certainly this one, not speaking for Debbie, but certainly this one, on, on Sunday, I like to go home after church. I like to eat a nice lunch. I like to take a nap. Sundays can be draining. Jesus left the synagogue, ready for some downtime. However, however, the rest he deserved wasn't coming to him this day because he then performed another miracle of healing instead. When the disciples told Jesus about Peter's mother-in-law, you know, it would be different if he did something else. So he's in the house, he's done his sermon, he's, he's, he's done extra work of a healing, and he's ready for some rest, and they run up to him and tell him about Peter's mother-in-law. You know, he could have said, don't worry, I'm here all week. I'll take care of this first thing tomorrow. He could have said, you know, I'm not actually on call this weekend. <laughs> you know, but I will, I will connect you with, with a prophet who can help. He could have said, you know, I'm just sitting down to eat. As soon as I have a sandwich and a cup of tea, I'll, I'll, I'll come in. But that is the wonderful thing about our relationship with Jesus. He never leaves our side. At no time will we ever be on holiday. On no occasion will he put us on hold. And we will never have to hear, I'll get there as soon as I can, or leave a message after the beep. When we have a need, no matter how tragic or <clears throat> trivial, Christ is there. This passage also teaches us that Jesus teaches us about love by displaying an incredible amount of compassion and power. He performed this miracle, not in the open air, not in a packed synagogue, not with crowds of people watching his every move. This miracle was completed in the privacy of someone's home. Jesus did what he did as God's son, out of compassion and to ease suffering. He demonstrated his power as the one and only one sent by God. Sent by God, not playing to the crowd, not seeking his own glory. Barclay says that, these, that there were written rules on how to help someone when they had a burning fever. And this process involved paraphernalia and popular magic of the day. Jesus disregarded all of this, and with a gesture and a word of authority, he healed this woman. That's special for us because it means Jesus doesn't have to prove himself to any of us. That is a great aspect of our faith. The compassion and power of Christ is such that we can approach him with no pretenses, no worries, no hidden agendas, no fear, no anxiety. His compassion and power are such that we can approach Christ no matter the issue, no matter the time, no matter how bad we think it is. 
the power and compassion of Christ points us to a God whose love for us is immense and strong and will see us through. And finally, today, Jesus teaches us about love by displaying a life of service. Now, to understand this aspect in today's passage, we need to focus our attention on Peter's mother-in-law. In verse 31, we read, So he went to her, took her hand, helped her up. The fever left, and she began to wait on them. Here is a woman whose fever was high enough to inca incapacitate her, to keep her in bed. She's in bed, she's wasting away, Jesus come in, he takes the fever from her, and she begins to serve them. Now scholars believe that Jesus came to the house about noontime, so we can assume that when she served them, she showed them hospitality, she was cooking them a meal, she was giving them the rest uh, that, that they so needed. So here's my question, what would you do if you were so sick that you were confined to bed and suddenly you were healed, what would your first action be? I may want to ease back into normal routines had I been that sick. I may first want to talk to people and tell them what happened. I may want to go and see my physician to make sure that, I'm, that everything is a-okay. I would also want my family to do all my chores for the next week or so just to make sure, you know, that, that, that I really am healed and ready and fit, as they say, for duty. When Christ showed compassion and healing and love and grace, this lady displayed a thankful heart and she began to selflessly serve others. How we live as Christians is unique to the ways of the world. The Christian life is a call to action. It is a roll up your sleeves, get your hands dirty type of living. It is a life filled with thankful hearts to the God who pours out his grace upon us every day. The love of Christ makes the arrogant humble, the apathetic committed, and the selfish selfless. The love of Christ helps us so that we may help others, forgives us so that we may forgive others, and loves us so that we may love others. Author Robert Fulgham, who is best known for his book, Everything I Needed to Know I Learned from Kindergarten. And he tells a story of his favorite professor. Uh, the man's name was Alexander uh, Papaderos. And he tells the story, uh, he was taking a two-week seminar, and he had learned great things from this professor in the two weeks of the course. And at the end of the course, on the last day, the professor asked if there were any questions. And after the obligatory awkward silence that filled the room, Fogum said, yes, professor, I have a question. What is the meaning of life? And uh, the room reacted just as you did, smiles, a little laughter, a little smirks, once that died down, once the nervousness of the question passed, once the professor could look into Fulgham's eyes and tell that he was sincere in what he was asking, he said, I will tell you what the meaning of life is. And he said, when, he said, when I was a boy, I was playing in the street and I came across the remnants of a, of a crash, you know, glass on the ground, mirrors on the ground. And I picked up the biggest piece of the broken glass, says the professor, and I went and sat on a rock and I scraped the edge of the glass on the rock till I made the mirror round and shiny. And he reached into his wallet and he pulled out from his wallet the mirror. It's about that big, maybe like a 50 cent piece size of a mirror. And he said, and I've kept that mirror to this day. When I was a boy, I quickly learned that I could reflect that mirror and I could make light shining places. And so I turned it into a game. I did what I did every day to see where I could make light shine in places. And I got really good at it. I could make that light shine in, in cupboards. I could make that light shine in crevices or crevasses, if you're from Britain. I could make that light shine through a keyhole. I got that good. And then I kept playing the game and I went about growing up and doing what you do in life. And then I became an adult. And I didn't have time for this childish game anymore. But I kept the mirror because playing that game all those years taught me a lesson. 
It taught me that in life, if I live a good person and a good existence in life, I can be like that mirror and I can reflect light into dark places. I can reflect light into people's lives when they are in need. I can reflect lives, light into the lives of my friends to make our relationship better. I can reflect light in people's hearts. With who I am, with what I have, with what I've been given, I can reflect light into this world and make it a better place. That, said the professor, is the meaning of life. And then he took the little mirror and he caused light to pick up on it. And he ended his story by reflecting the light of the mirror onto Robert Fulgren's face and hands as he sat in the classroom. That can be the meaning of life for us as Christians as well. We can use the light of God, and with God's help, we can reflect that light in all the dark places of this world. We know how, it's right here in Scripture, we've learned three ways that we can reflect the love of Christ. We can do things to help everybody. We can show that same compassion and power as we live our lives this day for God and we can be called to a life of service so that our light, so the light of God in us can shine and reach out to others. May we do that every day. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for what you do and say in our lives and we ask that you be with us and give us the courage to let that light shine now and always. Amen.